prayer. I call it the fish belly prayer. The prayer that you pray from the belly of the fish. The prayer like Jonah prayed. It's an honest prayer. It's a prayer that comes from the heart. It's a prayer that says, okay, Lord, I get it. It's a prayer that says the direction I've been going in life isn't the one you necessarily want me to go in. There is a better direction that you have for me, and now I'm ready to follow it. It's a prayer my father-in-law prayed many years ago. Back years ago, I guess my in-laws, my mother-in-law and father-in-law were probably in their late 50s, and they always loved Cape May. So they decided to buy a house in Cape May. And they were so excited, and uh, they live in Pennsylvania, so every weekend they would make the ride to South Jersey, they'd go down to Cape May, and they'd be puttering around working on this house. My father-in-law got a load of stone and put stone all across the front yard so he wouldn't have to cut the grass. And uh, he's trying to, you know, fit in with the shore community and the way they do things. And uh, so he decided that the trees nearby needed to be trimmed. So one day, uh, one Saturday, he got out a ladder and he gets up on the ladder and he leans it up against the branch, a big, big limb. You see where this is going, right? And uh, he's going to be trimming the, the branches. So the ladder is up against the branch. The problem is he goes too far up on the ladder. So all of a sudden, the ladder goes like this and throws him to the ground. And right away, he couldn't feel anything in his limbs. He just felt some tingling. So we got a call, my wife and I, that uh, he was being rushed to the hospital. And we didn't know what was going to happen. And he didn't know what was going to happen. And he was afraid. He would later find out that he had fractured several vertebrae and was within millimeters of being paralyzed for the rest of his life. And when he recovered from that, he thought a lot about that experience. It became a turning point in his life. As he began to think not just of himself and his life, he was a good Christian man, but he'd never really given thought to serving other people. He was kind of all about himself and his family and his job and now his house in Cape May. And his life took a different direction which is kind of what happened to this guy, Jonah. You know the story, right? Jonah and the great fish. This is a sermon series preaching through the four chapters of Jonah. It's a short book, just four chapters. In the first chapter, we looked at last week the, how he got into trouble. Jonah was a prophet of God, a man of faith. God came to him and said, I want to give you an assignment, Jonah. I want you to go to Nineveh and preach to them because they're wicked people. Well, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. It was a terrible place with wicked people, and so he didn't go. He got on a boat going the opposite direction. He was trying to run away from God. But while he's on the boat, a big storm comes up, sent by God, according to the story, and the sailors on the boat get panicky, and they realize that Jonah is the problem and the storm has come about because of his rebellion. And so the sailors say to Jonah, you know, what, what should we do with you? And Jonah at that point realizes what he's done. He's been running away from God. And he says, you know what? This storm isn't going to stop until you throw me overboard. And so reluctantly they do that. They were reluctant because they assumed it would mean his death. I don't know how deep the water was. I don't know how bad the storm was. If you've ever found yourself in water that you couldn't manage, you might have had a near drowning experience. And if you have, I have not myself, but what, from what people say, um, it's a frightening, terrifying experience. And if we listen to what Jonah says in the second chapter and read his prayer, which is basically what the whole chapter is, it's a prayer, we hear him describe his near drowning experience. When I was a kid, I grew up in Audubon. We went to the Audubon pool every summer. We called it the polio pit. 
because the water was often a little greenish. But my mother made us go because she wanted us to learn how to swim. And there was nothing else to do in Audubon in the summers, so every day we went and swam in the, poly, uh, in the Audubon pool. <laughs> and I, I had swimming lessons and I learned how to swim. And I'm glad for that because I would never want to have that experience of being dumped in water and feel myself going under and not being able to come up and get air. It reminds me of the story of the young man who wanted to find God in his life. And so he went in his village to the man who was the local wise person and said, oh, wise teacher, tell me how I can find God. And the wise teacher led him to the river and they started to wade into the river the young man thinking, well, this is going to be some kind of ritual cleansing ceremony. But all of a sudden, the wise teacher reached over with his hand and pushed the young man under the water and held his head under the water for what seemed like minutes. And the young man is flailing away. And finally, what seemed like at the last minute, he pulls his hand back and lets the young man up. And the young man is gasping for air, and he's dripping wet, and he's rubbing his eyes. And the wise teacher says to the young man, when I held your head under the water, what was the one thing you wanted more than anything? And the young man said, air, air. And the wise teacher said, when you want God that bad in your life, you will find him. And maybe that was Jonah's experience. Jonah, you know God, but you're running away from God, and maybe it's not until you are placed in peril that you will realize what it is that you really want. And maybe in that moment, you'll want God more than anything else. As we read his prayer in chapter 2, he talks about what the experience was like being dragged down in the water, seaweed wrapped around his head, Going down, he says, to the, to the roots of the mountain, to the very bottom, until he's rescued by a fish. This is how that second chapter reads. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord, my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. You hear the turn in his prayer. I was lost. I was down. I was drowning. I was ready to give up. But then I remembered. I remembered you, Lord. I remembered who you are and whose I am. I am yours. And I remembered how faithful you are to me. And so I have turned to you, Lord, in my heart. And I and I have decided to go a new path. I have decided I will sacrifice to you. I will keep the vows that I've made to you, the vows that I have ignored. And I will admit that salvation comes from the Lord. All this he prayed in the belly of the fish. That's how the chapter starts. He was in the belly, and he prayed this prayer. And then comes the gross part, the last verse. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Oh, man, it's such a beautiful prayer up to that point. Ugh. Fish belly slime all over him. I wonder what he looked like. I wonder what he smelled like when he came out of there. I don't know. But 
the experience of being in the belly of the fish did the trick. It did the job. It was enough to make Jonah stop and take stock of his life and say, wait a minute, what, what's the direction of my life? It's not the best direction. My life is moving in a way away from God, and God's calling me to come back. It's, it's a prayer that he prayed from the belly of the fish. It's a fish belly prayer. And sometimes it's the prayer that you and I pray when something dramatic happens in our lives. It causes us to step back and say, whoa, 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 what's, what's going on here? Some sermons ago, I shared the story of when I was about 18 and my best friend passed away suddenly from a brain aneurysm. And I'd never been to a funeral before. And I went to the funeral and listened to the pastor. And when I left that funeral, I have no idea. I mean, I don't remember what he said, but I know something happened. And I said to myself, you know what? My life has no direction. I'm just a young kid. I'm in college. I'm studying animal science technology. I was learning how to take care of animals and give them shots and do autopsies. And God said, mm 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 mm, mm. You're going to work with people. And when I tell people my story, sometimes they say, well, you know, there's not much difference sometimes between you know, animals and people. But I took a new direction. Something happened. It was a desperate time in my life when my friend passed away. He was the same age as me, 18. And when desperate things happen in your life and mine, we can, we can make a choice. We can either say, this is so bad that, you know what? I give up on God. I give up. This is it. I'm done. Or we can say, what is God saying in this? Because I know that in some way God can bring good out of bad. God can bring life out of death. God brings resurrection. So when we feel like something has died or something has been lost, what is it that God wants to revive and do again? What's the new direction that God wants to bring into my life so that I can leave this disaster behind and go forward? It's the belly prayers that cause us to move in a different direction. When we realize we wake up one day after we feel like we've been in the belly of the fish, lost, lonely, cold, afraid, oh, you've got my attention now, God. And I realize that you have something more for me, and you're leading me in a different direction than the direction I've been going. It was then, when he prayed the belly prayer, that he was released from the belly of the fish. After he makes this confession, after he realizes he needs to turn and go a different way, God says, all right, you got it, and vomits him up on the beach. And in the next week, we'll talk about getting second chances in life when we mess up, and how our God is the God of second chances. I think about the Apostle Paul when I think about stories like this. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament, his, he got a name change. His name was Saul. And when his name was Saul, he was kind of a bad guy. I mean, he was persecuting the Christians. He was happy to see Christians suffer. And then God said, mm -mm -mm -mm. you're not going to do that anymore. And he encountered God in this amazing experience. And he was blinded. He went through trauma. He was in the belly of the fish for days. He could not see until God sent another person to come and pray over him, a belly prayer. And Saul got it and said, okay, I need to have a new direction in my life. And he began to serve the Lord and became perhaps the greatest servant of the Lord. And it happens in the course of life, in your life and mine, a husband in a bad marriage, arguing with his wife all the time. She never understands. She never hears me. We just don't connect. It goes on year after year. And then he goes to work one day and learns that his co-worker's wife was suddenly killed in a car accident. And suddenly a, a, a switch is flipped. And he realizes... I've not seen my wife like I saw her the day I married her. What happened to the love that we had? What happened to the passion that I felt for her? Somehow life has gotten in the way, and work, and the kids, and all this other stuff, and somehow it's been lost. And he wakes up and realizes that his wife's not the whole problem, that he's not been the best husband, and that he has not always been listening and giving. 
and caring and demonstrating it. And he decides to go a new way. He could quit and give up. He could get divorced. He could say, that's it. I can't take you anymore. Or there could be a turning. There could be a fish belly prayer that says, I get it, God. I get it. I need to go a new direction. I need to have a new perspective. Or there's a, a mother who just can't seem to get along with her teenage daughter. They're always arguing. They're, they're seeing things so differently. Your room's a mess. Why don't you ever clean it up? You never help with chores around the house. Oh, Mom, you just don't understand. You just don't understand how it is. And they're just not connecting. And the mom's thinking, what am I going to do with this kid? And then the mother one night goes to a PTA meeting, and she hears there that from another parent that their teenage son just died from a drug overdose. And that switch is flipped, and she realizes, oh, my goodness. What have I been worrying about? What happened to that baby when she came into the world and I, and I held her in the hospital and I cried because I was so happy that she came to me? What happened to that? Where did my love and understanding for her go? Where did, how did it get lost in the midst of everything? It takes a soul-shaking experience sometime to step back and say, now wait a minute, what's going on here? What's been my direction in life? Is this where I really want to go? Is this where God's leading me? Or is this my will, not God's will? When God may be saying, no, I want you to turn and go this way. I want you to sit down and listen to your daughter. I want you to value her and prize her like you did the day she came into the world. I want you to know that she has her own struggles and she has peer pressure and she has all kinds of things going on. I want you to just sit and listen to her and understand her. And if you do, then she'll want to understand you. But you have to give. You have to demonstrate your love. It can't be all about the me. It's those experiences that sometimes help us to see that what we need is a fish belly prayer. We need to step back and say, Lord, in the midst of my trauma, you've been trying to speak to me, and I haven't been listening. It's in those moments that we realize that God is not a big, bad ogre trying to get us, but that God is a loving Father who pursues us and loves us with an everlasting love. And we'll keep throwing hints our way. But sometimes you know as well as I do, the lessons we learn in life, they, they mostly come in our struggles, not in our joy and our successes when things are great. It's when we really wrestle that we're willing to listen to the voice from above that says, follow me. Funny thing about my father-in-law, after he had his accident, he was praying fish belly prayers. Lord, you spared me a terrible life, being a paraplegic. You must have more for me. What is it that you want from me? What, is you, what do you have for me? He wasn't a bad person. He went to church every week. And God spoke to him and said, I want you to not just be about yourself, but to be about others. And so my father-in-law went to be trained to teach adults how to read. Yeah, that's right. We don't always realize the problem that illiteracy is in our country. And when he went through his training and he was assigned different men that he would sit with each week and teach how to read, he heard all kinds of stories. These, these were men in their 40s and 50s. Their whole lives they had never learned to read. They had always managed little tricks and gimmicks to get by, to understand what a sign says or go to the motor vehicle and bring somebody with them from home who could read the paperwork. These are men that my father-in-law spent time with and showed them literally the ABCs. And they began to read. And what a victory it was for them when they could read simple little books, children's books. And how much they felt empowered and how their lives were enriched when these dads could read their child a story which they had never been able to do because they couldn't read. 
because my father-in-law prayed a fish belly prayer and realized that God was speaking to him in a dramatic moment in his life and a switch was flipped and he realized that God had more for him. And when he listened, God spoke clearly and God has enriched his life. My father-in-law is 91. He's getting ornery. But he's been a great blessing, not just to his family, but to many men who over the years have expressed their gratitude for the gift that he gave them, all because in the belly of the fish he heard God speak. No, I have a new way for you to go. I have a new plan, and it's a better way and a better plan. Oh God, if we find ourselves in that belly, help us to know that it may even be part of your plan in some way that we can't see and can't understand, that you are trying to get our attention that you want more for us, that you have abundant life and blessings waiting for us if we're willing to recognize that we need to more fully give ourselves to you and to listen for your voice, a voice that can come through life itself and our life experiences. Oh, Lord, if we're feeling that we're in the belly, come and speak to us. Bring words of comfort and help us to find our way as we turn to you and recognize that you are the God of our salvation. This we pray in Jesus' name.